Salone del Mobile and Stir present Design Voices Think Next, produced by Dog Ear. Welcome to the live podcast from Salone del Mobile Milano. We are Amit Gupta, editor in chief of Stir, and William Bagnoli and Charlotte Roe of Que Studio. What's happening today? What are the ideas spreading in the fair? Follow us and let us meet the protagonist. Welcome, Eve Behar and Jakub Longe. Let me introduce Eve's and Jakub. Eve is the founder and principal director of Use Project. His work emphasizes the integration of commercial products with sustainability and social good. He's a sustainability advocate. He works mostly with brands related to technology and innovation. Fuse Project recently designed LEQ, which is a tabletop health companion targeted to reduce the growing alienation from modern technology for older adults. And many such projects are in the bag of Eves as Fuse Project Director. Welcome, Eves. Thank you. With Eves, we have Jakub Lange, partner of BIG Yaki Engels Group and head of BIG Ideas Project Unit, which was established in 2014. He has collaborated with Yaki Engels since 2003. Jakub is also a board member of Virgin Hyperloop One, an amazing project in the making. Special projects including Mass Science City in the Middle East, a green window farm technology, customized lamps and building systems. He won the commission for the mountain residences in Copenhagen, the new Tallinn Town Hall in Estonia, and high-end residential building 79 and park in Stockholm in Sweden. Welcome, Jakob. Thank you. Eves and Jakob, we, we are very happy to pair together into, in this informal conversation. One of the common points between both of you, you love skiing. Eves grew up in Switzerland, made snowboards and ski, and you, born in Denmark, go for skiing a lot. Tell us the mutual love for skiing and the mutual fondness for skiing and your personal anecdotes when you were skiing together. Well, first of all, it's very nice to meet you, Jacob. Um, I had a great time at your installation at um, Burning Man. Um, and uh, yeah, we should try to go ski together sometime. Yeah. Um, I, I saw that you went to Iceland and I was in Iceland as well recently. Yeah. So um, for me, you know, skiing, surfing, all these sort of uh, movement-based sports are um, it's just a great way to relax, even though, you know, sometimes in pictures or videos, it doesn't look so relaxing. It looks fast and furious, but, um, no, it's a great way to be in the element. Um, it's actually very Zen for me. So I grew up in Switzerland, obviously the mountains, um, were the best escape. I remember in one of the interviews we had with you earlier and you said, I'm an ocean baby. <laughs> Yes, even though I grew up in a landlocked country, so that was the second part of my life. But the first part of my life was skiing and snowboarding in Switzerland. Awesome. Yeah, so the the interesting part is that Denmark is flat as pa pancake. We don't have any mountains at all. Uh, so we are we are building our own mountains. Our, one of our latest projects is, is the waste to energy power plant with a ski hill uh, on top of it. Um, but I, I learned skiing with my uh, with my family in uh, in Norway, going cross country, and at some point they they introduced me to telemark skiing, which is this sort of in between cross country and uh, alpine skiing, and I've been doing that uh, ever since. Uh, now sort of uh, going here and there, and one one thing that I noticed when skiing is that because it it requires quite a lot of coordination and focus. Uh, then your mind doesn't wander. You you are completely immersed in that um, sport uh, at the moment. So you can't think about work or family or friends. Even you know it's it's all about the mountain, the snow, and 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 that feeling. And and I think that's what I really like about skiing is to sort of have this uh, this time a bit for my myself. Uh, so we both found uh, passions that were not available in our home countries. Yeah. Surfing for me, skiing for you. Um, how is the, um, the hill um, that you built in, um, in Copenhagen, how is it for snowboarding? Is it good for skiing and snowboarding or mostly skiing? 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's made with a artificial ski slope material uh, that is like a plastic-like uh, yeah. material that um, we work together with a company called Neviplast Developing. Um, it's a, it feels a bit like a very hard piece. So, so if you fall, you hurt yourself a little bit, but it's not too bad. It's not like you break bones or anything. But it, mm. uh, but you can actually get a decent uh, edge on the material, even for snowboarders. Nice. You've got to do it sometime. Apart from being meditative to you, um, do you draw some inspiration from nature, from being in nature? I mean, for me, I draw inspiration from everything, really. Um, you know, the, the idiosyncrasies of modern life, the, you know, frictions that you experience, technology and, and nature, too. But it's not uh, for me. Inspiration is not singular. It tends to um, be multiple. Um, it tends to come from a lot of different places. It, yeah, I, I think for me, uh, nature is kind of a, you know, it's a bit like the <clears throat> the skiing is that one when you go kind of nurture your plants, uh, then then your your mind also doesn't wander. You're like immersed with the nature. Um, I. I brought uh, over 50 plants into my home, so I can't live like in a jungle, but in the center of Copenhagen. And uh, now I bought a house out away from everybody, no neighbors. So I think it's an important part of my life just to get away from kind of all the man-made things where nature is kind of nature-made. On the other hand, both of your work is um, based a lot on new technologies. Um, that often tackle equally new problems. How does it feel to move into areas that are unknown? And for me, being now more than 25 years in um, in uh, Silicon Valley in San Francisco, um, it was really like an adventure. Um, arriving there, being you know 23 or so, and and uh, having actually people listen to you. People actually be interested in your opinion and your participation in new projects was really fascinating. And so what I love is the notion of invention, the fact that so many of the projects we work on are new to the world, um, new types of experiences and interactions um, have to be created around that. And that's, um, you know, that there's, there's so much that I learned from it. Um, and there is also so much that you have to gather just listening to people, observing people, being empathetic. Um, so it, it, um, it's a great combination of sort of human problems, but also obviously technological design problems. Yeah, I think the, the interesting part about uh, this conversation is especially that, that we sort of come from two uh, parts of designing where where Eve's uh, work is is focused on the sort of the object, and um, I come from the other side where uh, where I as an op as an architect I I use objects, put objects together to create buildings that we live in. So we select a door handle that has been designed maybe by Eve or another com company. We select a lamp. Uh, Insulation materials, window frames, store uh, uh, flooring, and so forth. So, in a way, architects are, are a bit like curators of uh, design. Um, and so, so there is a. So we saw the need at some point to, uh, to, to integrate more with the design by by also starting to uh, to design uh, products for our uh, buildings. And sometimes we do get sort of approached by by companies that that, that often want to innovate. Of course, in you mentioned the Virgin Hyperloop One, which is this uh, fast speed transportation in a vacuum tube, uh, close to the speed of sound, uh, which is part of our objects that we put into our city planning. So in a way, it's just a, a very large, um, very large object, but. Uh, so, so we do also get approached by by a lot of new technologies, but I I find it quite interesting this sort of difference in the way we approach design. Um, but in many ways, I mean, whether you you work on a building or whether you work on a on an object or an experience, 
um, it's still a lot of parts that mm -hmm. have to come together. Uh, yeah. Different components, different technologies, different types of screens and materials. Um, <clears throat> so it's 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 a lot about inventing, and it's a lot about also using kits of parts mm -hmm. uh, to to build something yeah. new. You preempted uh, <clears throat> the next question: product design versus architecture. Um, is there a balance between a creative freedom which both the discipline enjoys, or is there more creative freedom as a product designer and less creative freedom in an architecture or vice versa. I mean, for me, I've I've played with architecture, architectural scale, you know, all the way to the miniature scale, to things that are would fit on my pinky nail, but you know, all the way to to small buildings, for example. And you know, it's been really interesting for me to stretch from the object to 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 the to the building scale because I. In some ways, it's the same ideas, but um, the technicalities, some of the constraints, some of the materiality, et cetera, is somewhat different. It's, it's really a learning curve for me. And I'm, I think at this stage of my creative life, I feel the more I can learn in places that are not directly connected to the object, um, the more fun it is, whether it's digital, virtual, or larger physical environments. Yeah, and you, and you mentioned the the tolerances. Of course, that's also one of the the main differences in in architecture. We often work with the tolerances up to you know twenty millimeters, uh, sometimes fifty millimeters if you for the for the concrete. And then once you select your 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 wall panels and so on, then you can go down to a, a smaller tolerances. But there is quite a, quite a sort of and the, and then the other thing is also. A building is often built once, uh, you know, on a specific location, and then the neighbor site, you would you would build it a little bit differently because then the view is in another direction, and the entrance then has to be from the side and so on. So, so you know, we we make singular, uh, and and product design is often uh, yeah. multiple. But both of us have worked on uh, prefab buildings, three yeah. D printed buildings, yes. um, and that's where there is a lot of connective tissue in yeah. a way, which is um, how to build buildings uh, and environments more efficiently because they're made in a factory versus mm -hmm. made on site, for example, which has been a big sustainability boost and uh, an interest for me. There is a tolerance which is driven up, up, out of maths and physics, but today the changing, ever-changing human behavior, uh, especially what we've gone through in the last few years, what would you say about a tolerance which is, has an emotional quotient? Where is the emotional tolerance? And mm -hmm. where we are when it comes to a social fabric, comparing that with emotional tolerance of the community we are in, the part of the universe we are in? Yeah, it's been an interesting time for sure. And I think it's actually been harder to come out of the pandemic than go into it, meaning the switch, when the switch got pulled and it said, everybody go home, nobody goes into the office, nobody can socialize, it was almost easier to adapt than to the return, return to the office, return to community. Um, even though, you know, I think socially and travel wise, people are doing it now with a vengeance, um, or at least some people, um, <clears throat> you know, it was, it, was, um, it was definitely a challenge. I would say that resilience has become more important. Um, I think we were quite resilient. Our offices continue to work. We continue to create. We continue to build projects, to launch projects during COVID. And, uh, and our ability to adapt um, to, to this whole new, really sort of never experienced before world um, actually really impressed me. And the creativity that people use, the technologies they use in order to do so was quite... Um, you know, quite invigorating and gave me a lot of hope. But of course, you know, the, the, the heavy toll also that the pandemic had on, on human psychology, um, on mental health, et cetera, is, is, is clearly now still with us as we transition back to, go, to going back to work. We're actually working on two really interesting projects around uh, mental health and education, education for children, and men mental health for adults, um, including depression. But that's a 
that's more of a long-term project, but it could be a game changer. Yeah, <clears throat> I think, so uh, uh, as Eve says, it was quite easy getting into the, the whole uh, close down. And I, I think some of our better architecture actually came out of this new uh, situation. You know, sometimes you need to stress or like create stress in the system in order to to create new solutions you need to you then you evolve the system evolves the design processes evolve and um, but we also see a kind of a, a demand from the our clients that suddenly they needed offices with more flexibility and uh, and within the uh, the sort of product design industrial design world uh, you know sanitation uh, those kind of things became more and more important. Uh, we're working together with uh, Atimide about uh, uh, developing sort of a light system and and they, they are seeing these sort of antibacterial uh, sort of uh, UV lights that you can uh, shine on a, a tabletop when you go home from work and in the next morning you have sort of sanitized everything. So you see these sort of new emerging technologies sort of being implemented in uh, a lot of different uh, types of environments and, and products. You're both um, designing a lot of new technologies and working with new technologies, but if you just could lean back and relax for a moment, is there a technology you wish somebody else would design for you? Something that you wish would be here already for you? I think um, <clears throat> ways to travel, uh, you know, space travel without having to get into a plane and a bus and a train and a taxi to get here, which um, was a long journey. So, um, yeah, I mean, of course, that's more science fiction um, than real science. But, um, you know, I'm always surprised about the inventions that are walking through our doors at Fuse Project. I'm always surprised about um, the level of new thinking, new science um, that's happening. So a lot of the things I've worked on were really invented in, in, in partnership with design. And I think that's when I think some of the um, some of these new technologies are most compelling. When it's not just about technologists, it's not just engineers, it's not just a lab that's making it, but really a, a partnership between new science and the science of living, which uh, design and architecture really bring to the table. Yeah, I, th I think um, sort of we, at big, we are quite sort of interested in, in of course, sustainability as, as we all are and, and how we can transform our cities into to much more sustainable. And it's clear that one of the key things that we, that if we just had more electricity, you know, if we had a system that that just oozed with with the electricity, then we can produce for free. We can uh, build for free because you know it's it's about stacking bricks essentially. Of course, some of the processes that we're using in architecture uh, by like cement is is uh, one of the big, bigger contributors of uh, CO two to our atmosphere, but but uh, technologies that would uh, enable us to build a lot more sustainable. It's we are sort of almost on the brink. You know, I think within the next ten years we are gonna find ways of reducing drastically within the building industry. Um, but I, I really think one of the key um, keys would be more electricity from solar, wind, fusion power, um, uh, wave technologies uh, like uh, ocean wave technologies, and so forth would really help us uh, to, to to not feel guilty when we are producing, uh, you know, because that, I yeah. think that's the challenge. Free, free energy is a game changer for humanity, for sure. And um, it is all around us and it is free. We just don't, don't know how to capture it yet. Um, but there is an abundance of free energy on the on the planet. Um, and currently the way we produce energy is actually extractive and extremely polluting. Um, but when we get to a free energy um, world, um, a lot of the other problems that we're experiencing um, today get solved. Mm -hmm. 
But given we all talk about sustainability, and I agree, uh, free energy as well as the adaptive use of what we already have, 7.2 billion people on this planet Earth, do we really need to build more? Well, that's a question I get asked all the time. And, and, and you know, when a journalist asks me this question, I usually come back to them and say, well, do we need another book? Do we need another <laughs> idea? Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> for me, the answer is really obvious, which is the things that we are producing today um, are so much more sustainable when they're designed right than they were in the past. So the Herman Miller chair I designed, um, if you were using a version of that chair from the 1970s or 80s, you know, it would use two, three, four hundred percent more materials and not, you know, the type of materials you want to put in the, in, in, in the world anymore. Think about cars. I mean, I've, I've driven an electric car for 10 years. If, if the multiplic multiplication of cars was just the same level of pollution as what we produced in the 60s and 70s, um, we would be in real trouble mm -hmm. from an environmental standpoint. So yes, we absolutely need to make more because the new things replace the much you know, more highly pollutive um, uh, you know, items that we need for our everyday lives. That said, I love vintage objects, and if you can keep something for 50 years or 100 years, that's great. Um, but obviously not everything in our lives or around us can fit that model. And, and I think with it, within the architecture, our buildings are also evolving drastically with sensor technologies and, and especially insul insulation. So a couple of years ago only, you know, it, we are here in Italy. Uh, many buildings are not really insulated. Um, so we just uh, use electricity to then heat them up or cool them down uh, in the summertime. But if we were to insulate the building much better, uh, we, can, we can save that energy uh, from somewhere else. Uh, today, we are building buildings that are much better insulated. So by not uh, knocking down a building, uh, we would actually use more energy because we have to keep it warm or cold, that building. But we can take it down and it might cost something to build a new building. But after 10, uh, 12 years, perhaps, we have already saved the same amount. And from that point on, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a really good business in terms of energy. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Yves. Thank you for being with us today on Design Voices by Salon de Mobile. Um, we enjoyed the conversation and I hope you enjoyed it as much and look forward to having more of your voices and the powerful statement that you just said for the audience to listen and hear. Thank you. Yeah. It was fun. Thanks.